Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, so, uh, I guess what I'm saying is I move toward a parent model for a therapist. So, the, as Bruce said this morning, we've got to find co-therapists. There aren't enough therapists to go around to help all the traumatized kids. Plus, you don't want them in your home. <laughs> I mean, you don't want traumatized children living with you. You like to do it eight hours a day, maybe, but not 24-7. So therapeutic uh, foster care and group homes and adoptive parents, uh, it's remarkable what they're doing because it's very, very difficult. Uh, but there are parents, there are uh, direct care staff and residential programs and group homes, foster carers who are more than committed to doing this incredibly difficult work if we facilitate their ability to do it and model it and talk about what is therapeutic about it, what is effective, and how to help the parent then do it is a lot of what I do, both in therapy but also with recommendations for parenting that are attachment-based recommendations. Uh, rather than, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here to criticize, well, I might throw in a bit of criticism, rather than the cognitive behavioral interventions that most parents and teachers are educated in, uh, that in general without attachments, without attachments you already tend to be ineffectual. In, in any lasting, significant way, is what most people agree with me about who do this kind of work. Okay, uh, so what is the attitude of parents? What, what am I looking for with parents? How do I facilitate uh, uh, a parent's uh, ability to parent a child, and how do I facilitate a therapist's ability to uh, help a child to move through uh, trauma? by developing attachment security with the therapist and the parent. Well, I'm looking at what the parents do with their kids and the attitude that I teach and try to model for the parents I'm working with, uh, I call it PACE. It's short for Playful, Accepting, Curious, and Empathic. And your handouts are on your CD. You can look at them if you want while you're going along here. That was a joke. Too. I'm sorry. The handouts are on the CD. Uh, so eventually, if you have a computer at home, you could look at the handouts. You could do it tonight, print them out, and bring them in tomorrow. Okay. Uh, playfulness. Why is playful helpful for these kids? Because they can't be affectionate. They can't, they can't, they don't respond well to love. It's way too scary for them. Uh, clear affection, uh, enjoyment, communicating how special they are to you really scares so many kids. Foster carers, adoptive parents have had so many problems trying to be affectionate with kids. They are touch aversive, but they're aversive to any sign of that you're really special to me. It doesn't fit their sense of self. It, it forces them too quickly to change their whole worldview because their worldview says they're bad, rotten, ugly kids and they'll never be loved. So I have to be very cautious about how that happens, how I'm going to facilitate that. Playfulness is a great way. It's affection light, it's sort of like Bud Light. You know, it just it approaches a person in a lighter way. And when you're sitting with a kid and you're laughing and giggling together and you have eye contact, you have kids really warm and soften and get closer to you and start to share all sorts of things they never would have shared if they weren't laughing <laughs> ten seconds before. So it's really a way of enjoying kids. It's a way of moving them into positive affective states. Uh, Affect regulation is one of the people in attachment argue about why it's so effective, why there's been 10,000 studies showing it's effective. And one of the biggest uh, camps of these folks uh, are those who say it's because it facilitates the ability to regulate affective states. Securely attached people can do it so much better than people with attachment problems. They don't, you don't regulate affect very well when you have attachment problems. You, you've never developed those abilities. Well. We focus as therapists on negative affective states. On can't regulate fear, it becomes terror. They can't regulate anger, it becomes rage. They can't regulate uh, sadness, it becomes despair. Uh, and shame just goes very pervasive. So they don't regulate negative emotion, and we got to focus on that. The, the emotions that are associated with the most negative affective states, they don't regulate those very well at all. Uh, but the researchers say they also don't regulate positive affective states. Anytime they're excited, it becomes anxiety. Love, joy becomes anxiety. It just really dysregulates them. 
when they move into positive emotions. So they need practice. Playfulness is one way to give them practice, where they're laughing and giggling and being silly. And uh, um, and getting close, and all of a sudden they can do it a little better tomorrow, and a little better the day after that, and a little better the day after that, the repetition of it. And then they start to get close, and they sit, start to just sit closer to you. So if I can find ways to do that, to facilitate that, it also helps the kids move into... Uh, uh, it gives them a break, when I say it that way. It gives them a break from the hard things that therapy is about and the hard things their life is about. So playfulness is a way to... They, they, as it, Trevartan, who's not a psychologist, he's a psycho, not a clinician, I should say. Uh, he said, I'm always puzzled by you therapists. You work with people who are filled with trauma in their life, right? And nothing but negative life experiences, right? And all you do in therapy is focus on their negative life experiences. Why don't you ever focus on the positive? I said, I have no idea. Are you suggesting we do that? Yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. Well, why don't I try it? Well, I'm overstating a bit, but uh, here's a good point. That in therapy, when I can help a kid to feel safe with me, I can help them to stretch into positive emotional experiences. It's a rare session the kid isn't doing some laughing. This might be ten minutes before they're doing some crying, which is ten minutes before they're swearing at me about something. <laughs> Uh, hopefully by the end of the session they're laughing again, but they may not be. Uh, laughter, uh, one neurologist said laughter, the part of the brain that's active when you're laughing is never active when you're feeling shame, which is an important bit of research if it's accurate in terms of another benefit of uh, helping kids just laugh and be silly. Uh, also, uh, having a sense of humor means you could take another perspective on things. You see it one way, all of a sudden you see it differently, and that's the sort of the sudden realization that this is funny. Then you start laughing because you're sort of taken off balance by stuff. So a lot of the kids we work with have a terrible sense of humor. They can't do it very well. They can't reflect enough. They can't take another person's perspective very well. They're locked in their own world, so experience becomes objective to them. So if I can facilitate the ability to laugh, I can help kids to move into... Uh, uh, another way of looking at the world, which is more receptive to other people's perspectives, which is really a big step toward reducing, uh, attributing negative stuff to other people's minds all the time, like the kids do all the time. <clears throat> Let me give you one example of that. Uh, a 12 year old boy is sitting there being snotty and all, not happy to work with me. <clears throat> so he's on the couch. I, 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 I can work without a lot of stuff, but I got to have a couch. Although sometimes I have to work without a couch. It's really hard though, because I like to sit close to kids and have the parents sit close to the kid. So the kid's always in the middle between me and the parents. I'm sitting close to this teenage boy. He's not happy being there. He's not happy with my anything about me, but especially my sitting close. And at one point, he looked at me and says, "Don't sit so close." And I said, "I cock. What do you mean, don't sit so close? Like, the only way I can work with you and get to know you is sit this close. Otherwise, you probably won't even notice me. I got to be close to work with you. Well, I don't want you to sit so close. Why? Why, why can't I?" Another in intervention I, I've really got good at is called whining. <laughs> If you whine without anger, it's a good way to be close to people. Parents don't know how to do it well. I give parents practice in whining because they put anger in it, and that messes it up. When they whine, they tend to get angry because their kid doesn't do something. But if you whine, not with sarcasm. There's a difference between sarcasm and just playfulness. If you whine with a bit of playfulness, kids don't know what to do with it. So I'm whining with this kid about, I can't work with you if I sit over in that chair over there. How could I possibly do that? You wouldn't pay attention to me. I wouldn't notice all these beautiful signals you're giving me about what you need from me and stuff like that. I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. At which point he says, well, it's your bad breath I don't like. <laughs> At which point I said, hey, deal with it. Small price to pay for therapeutic benefit. I don't like it. Bad breath. Get away from me. I said, listen, if you work a little harder in therapy, I'll put a mint in my mouth. <laughs> no, right now, no mint. You're not working hard enough. <laughs> That's not fair. 
Well, you just got to deal with it. What's hard about it? Come on, I'll help you with this. I'll help you. Yeah, I know it might be difficult working with somebody with bad breath, but you know, I'm more than willing to find a way to make it easier for you. But no mint yet. You gotta, yeah. So anyway, 10 minutes later, I was happy. He's engaged with me. So I jumped up, ran to my desk, found a mint, put it on my mouth, came back, stuck on, sucked on the mint, leaned over and says, how am I doing? Oh, can I have one? <laughs> so I said, lean over. No, your breath is fine. You don't need one. I want one. You don't need one. I only have six left. I have six more kids I'm going to see today. I've got to say that <laughs> these poor other kids, they're going to need them in too. That's not fair. Well, I don't know if it's fair or not. I only have six I can share one with you. So, you know, but thanks for sharing that. You know, now I can help these other kids better because you alerted me to the problem of my bad breath. So he's moaning and groaning, but we had a decent session and he leaves. So he comes in the next week. He comes over and sits down. Oh, I'm chatting. I sit down next to him and he leans against me and said, Hi, Dan. Well, on the way to therapy in the car, he chewed on a piece of garlic. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely... That was uh, just such a lovely sign. I mean, what it meant was he had thought about me between sessions. He had thought about a way to connect to me. He had moved into some playfulness. He wanted to see the impact it would have on me. Uh, he was engaged. This was a tough 12-year-old who didn't want to be there, and he chewed on a piece of garlic for me. I mean, I was so touched by that. I was so impressed. Uh, so what, I had to give him the response he wanted, which was to scream. I jumped up, ran out of the room, put water on my head and drank some water, came back in, sat on the chair way on the other side of the room, went to my desk, got my pack of mints, threw, and I threw them at him, said, eat them all. Oh, he was loving it. He's sitting there laughing and roaring with laughter while he's sucking on these mints. I came about 10 minutes. I came over and sat next to him. I said, okay, I'm ready. He breathed on me. I said, oh, it's not too bad. I can stay here. Anyway, the kid responded and said, that. he's my bad breath cure. He actually became engaged in therapy. Uh, okay. I'm not, it's not a technique. I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> Ah, you got uh, That's the attunement bit. You got to take what you got. You take what the, your client gives you, like that. Uh, and, and it's a playful stance that I'm really looking for in doing that. Oh, okay. We got some more time. Um, why don't I? Why don't I just move on a little bit? I, I do have a couple of tapes to show you. And, um, I'll give you some example. I don't know if on these tapes the playfulness. Uh, why don't I move on to the next, which is curiosity. Why is that important? It's important because that's the basis of the parent-child relationship. That's how a parent gets to know their kid. Uh, with a baby, you're extremely curious, aren't you? I mean, you, you brag about your kid. You tell, you tell your next-door neighbor. You, you're on a, on a bus. You talk to the person next to you about your baby at home. You tell them everything your baby did yesterday. Uh, it's like they, they're interested, right? I mean, but you can't believe they won't be interested because you're so darn interested. You're constantly observing and discovering your baby. We're intensely curious about our babies. It just doesn't go away, that curiosity. Babies need us to be that way. They need us to have what researchers call positive delusions about them. <clears throat> People, some parents get upset about that. I don't have any delusions about my baby. He or she is the best, most clever, best musician, best athlete in the world ever, history. And that's called a delusion. I hate to say that. It really is. But babies need us to have positive delusions. They need us to respond that way and constantly discovering qualities about them. If we don't discover qualities about them, they don't discover those qualities about themselves. Or if we put a negative label to the qualities, they put a negative label to the qualities. And this is Trevarthan's gift to child development in terms of how he, he develops the notion of intersubjectivity. Okay, so that curious stance, it, and that's not most, that many therapists, uh, good old Adelaide has Michael White talks about uh, curiosity to the roosters come home. He loves curiosity. I had a meeting with him, we had a curiosity battle. I was trying to be more curious than he was, and he was trying to be more curious than I was. Uh, went on. It was quite a long breakfast we had. We wouldn't give in on who was the most curious. Uh, but curiosity really is a fundamental aspect of what I'm going to be doing with kids because they have no clue what's going on inside of them. 
they don't know who they are. What they got is negative or what they got is uh, a blank slate. Uh, much research shows that abused, neglected kids don't know why they do things. They don't know their motives. They don't know their thoughts. They don't know their feelings. They can't tell you their perceptions. They just are very bad about their inner life. So my curiosity will give them the ability to become curious themselves about why they do things, what it's about, who they are, to develop a sense of self that's coherent, what the researchers call a coherent autobiographical narrative. They really have to develop that. And my curiosity will do that. But curiosity is not, why'd you do that? That's not curiosity. That's admit that you were wrong, tell me exactly what you want, you know I want you to say, and follow up with some good restitution and remorse. That's not curiosity. Curiosity is more, hey, what was going on? What, what, what do you think was behind what you just uh, did? You got yourself into trouble. Any idea what that's about? That's curiosity. It's no judgment associated with it. No right or wrong about motives. There's no right or wrong about thoughts. There's no right or wrong about feelings. It's just who you are. It's an aspect of yourself. And that's curiosity. When I can help a kid to develop the ability to be curious about self, I can help a kid start to change. And if I can facilitate a parent's ability to be curious without judgment, I can help a parent to start to give a kid a sense of being worthwhile even when they make mistakes, that their behavior is not their self. They don't believe you when you say that. I'm just mad at your behavior, not about you. They never believe you. But if they have curiosity, and I have curiosity, they start to get it, that I'm not angry about your thoughts or your motives. I might be angry about some of your behavior, but not about what led to the behavior. Curiosity frees kids to move into it. And, it, and I can be curious with four-year-olds. You're just different than you are with 14-year-olds. Uh, many folks are somewhat skeptical about this model of therapy for four-year-olds. It's because they try to talk to a four-year-old like they're 14. But with a four-year-old, you just say, Hey, oh, what, 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 help me understand that. What was that about? Any idea? I need to know. I need to know. Then they want to tell you. And they say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Well, let's figure it out. We can do it, can't we? Let's see what was going on. Oh, 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 oh yeah, your mama says that your sister can do it. And you couldn't. She says you couldn't do it. Your sister could, but you couldn't. And you says, wait, mama, I want to do it too. Is that what was going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that was. You were all upset because your sister was allowed and you weren't allowed. How come? How come you wanted to know? How come? Okay, you, you alright? You got it? I'm a little embarrassed. I, can't, I don't want to continue with it. Uh, you need a four-year-old to do this. and uh, Would you be willing to... I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's a different way of communicating. It's communicating the way the person experiences as communication. So you communicate with a four-year-old like a four-year-old, like a ten-year-old, or a fifteen-year-old, or an eighteen-year-old. Okay. The last is empathy. Uh, empathy is I'm with you uh, in your affective states. I'm with you in your trauma. I'm with you in the events of your past that you're really struggling with. And being with you with empathy means I'm helping you to regulate that affective state. You don't have to do it alone. Many of the kids we work with don't cry anymore. They are totally against tears. Well, one reason is they probably cried and cried and cried and cried alone for hours and hours and days and days that it is so painful they're not going to do it anymore. They didn't get anything out of it. It didn't lead anywhere. So they stopped crying. Well, I have to help the kid to experience that if you cry with somebody, it's not a horrific experience like that. In fact, it's a healing experience. You get it that somebody is with you in that experience and all of a sudden the experience starts to change because the meaning of it changes. So I have to help kids to move into affective states and the only way I could do that is I go into it with them. And that's the active use of empathy where it's very clear the impact they have on me. Both positive, there's positive empathy too, as well as their negative affective states. Uh, uh, let me give you an example of a 12-year-old girl from an orphanage who is uh, trying to understand uh, herself very well. She, uh, this is a long story, but a brief bit. Is finally she was, when I said, close your eyes and, and give me the first word that pops into your head when you say your name to yourself over and over again. So she kept saying her name to herself. We'll call her Linda. Finally she said, garbage. I said, okay, that's the word. Okay, any idea what that's about? 
Oh. Did you ever think you're garbage? Like, no. What do you think of that? You just said, I don't know why I picked that word. You just picked that word. Okay, so we don't know. Okay. So when you think about garbage, do you have any other feelings connected to it? Or is it an okay thought or word? Can you say garbage yourself? Well, she could do it without didn't activate anything. So we're, we connected to eventually the word garbage. We were able to connect to her orphanage experience and uh, her sense of the orphanage. Uh, that garbage word uh, fit her experience in the orphanage. And then uh, uh, it went on a bit and I was helping her to actually feel how miserable she was in the orphanage because she had dissociated. She didn't have any feelings about the orphanage. She was surprised when I said her life in the orphanage was a lot harder than my life ever. Oh, it was? Yeah, it was. And the reasons why. Uh, the reasons why the staff would laugh when the other kids beat her up. Uh, they'd make her sleep on the floor in the bathroom without a blanket. Uh, they would put her in a closet. Uh, they'd take her food away from her. You know, various things like that that she had no emotional response to. Well, because I had an emotional response to those things, she started having an emotional response to those things. Affect is contagious. And empathy, if you really feel something that another person, you would think they might feel, you're not telling them they should feel it, but you think they might, they often start feeling it. I can lead a kid into their experience that they've dissociated from by having that experience because it's so darn contagious. Emotion is extremely contagious. If you're with a friend having lunch, one of you is in a good mood, one is in a bad mood, within 10 minutes you're either both be in a good mood or both be in a bad mood. It's just very difficult to be with somebody in a different emotional state than you are for any period of time, which is a a benefit of emotional contagion, uh, which is, so if I'm in a good, decent emotional state, I can affect the kid's emotional state, and it's a disadvantage. The kid can affect my emotional state. So pretty soon, I'm as angry as the kid is, or as pessimistic. And in fact, uh, the therapists who train with me, I'm constantly asking them to be aware of their own emotional state, that the kids have ways, they've developed patterns of having effects on people based on their history, very adaptive patterns, but they spend their life looking for ways to move people into four emotional states, and they try to push you in those states. So I'm constantly aware of that and asking the therapist to be aware of it. And that's, that's what makes us professionals. The kids can't do it to us, hopefully. Uh, I mean, they're, they're really good at getting people to get angry, number one. They like to get us angry. Number two is frightened. If we're not angry at them, they're happy if we're afraid of them, or vice versa. Number three is giving up on them, moving into despair, hopelessness. And number four is feeling inadequate as a person with them. I can't help this kid, which means I'm going to feel some shame in my role as a therapist or in my role as a parent or a carer. So the kids are going to push me, and their contagious effect is to move me into anger, uh, anxiety, shame, or despair, giving up. Uh, so I have to be extremely aware of that so that I can move the kid into an emotional state that I want them to be, which is a much more uh, positive, hopeful, safe, sharing uh, state. In fact, that way. Uh, okay. Uh, I got distracted and I, it happens. <laughs> As you mature in life get distracted more easily. <clears throat> okay, this girl, the garbage, right. Okay, so she's trying to, so I'm, she's still struggling. So she's finally uh, experiencing sadness about the orphanage and she sat there and she said, I never knew how sad that was. She was stunned. And I said, yeah, it was very, very sad, your life in the orphanage for six years. And she sat there and I said, would you be willing to do this now that you sort of have a sense of how sad it was? Would you close your eyes and this time say the word garbage to yourself over and over and over again? And when you feel something, I don't know what you're going to feel, but it's going to be something and it might not be the best feeling in the world. I want you to open your eyes and look into your mother's eyes, your adopted mom's eyes. Would you be willing to do that? Okay. So she closed her eyes and you see she's really working at something. 
And all of a sudden you see her change, and all of a sudden she opens her eyes, looks right into her mother's eyes, and then she starts shaking, like she was freezing. And she's shaking, and she only held her eye contact with her mother for about 10 seconds, and then she pulled back, she sat back on the couch, rode up into a ball and started rocking in a fetal position. Now she's rocking and rocking, just shaking away. She's not regulating her affect very well. She's feeling, I mean, she's been dissociated for years. It's not that surprising. The emotional states are going to be very powerful for her. So she's sitting there rocking and mom is comforting her, has her hand on her, on her shoulder, on her hair, stroking her hair, just talking very quietly. Finally she calmed down and she just lie there quietly, oh, five minutes, ten minutes. And she opened her eyes and her mom again was talking quietly and I said, tell me what happened there. Help me understand. What, what just happened? And she said, my mother could see the garbage. And then my mother started to feel the garbage. And that's what terrified her, when her mother felt the garbage. Well, what had her mother done? Her mother had an empathy for her. Her mother had was attuned to her extremely shameful, terrifying emotional state, and the kid was terrified of the mother's empathy. She wasn't, didn't know, she never experienced this in her life. Some human being is with you in this state, and she couldn't handle it. So I said to her, that's what moms do. You didn't know that, did you? For 12 years, you never knew what mothers are all about. That's what moms do. This mom can do it. This mom loves you. She wants to do it. So would you be willing to do it again? Yeah, take a deep breath. I think you're ready. Close your eyes again. So she did. Close her eyes. She's there. You could hear, hear her. Imagine, I mean, I'm looking at her. So she's saying the word garbage again. All of a sudden she opened her eyes again, this time more tentatively, but she did. Looks into her mother's eyes. Within 10 seconds, tears were coming down. This kid had never cried. She starts crying. A third of a second later, mom started crying. So now they're crying, staring at each other. And then, uh, oh gosh, they couldn't handle it for more than a minute or two. Uh, at which point, mom just grabbed her and held her and started rocking her and they're crying and crying and crying, the two of them together. So, uh, okay, she's starting to feel. Well, she's feeling big, big despair, depression, uh, terror. So she's getting a lot of cuddling at home, asking for it. She's flooded with memories. One of the memories was of a little girl that she had protected in the orphanage from the big kids and said, actually said to these kids, if you want somebody to beat up, beat me up instead of her. The three-year-old, she was six at the time. So they beat her up then. So, uh, okay. So she has all these memories. And then uh, one night, she, uh, her mom was reading in bed. She came in and she was just crying and crying. And so mom held her and rocked her for 15 minutes in bed and... And then my mom says, well, what's it about, sweetie? And the kid said, I left Tasha behind. I was a little girl in the orphanage. She had abandoned the little girl. From her point of view, she was six when she was adopted. And that's what she was, well, that wasn't the core of it, but that certainly was the, became a metaphor for everything bad about her in her life. Uh, well, that's the empathy that she got from her mother, that she experienced from her mother. And it was terrifying at first, and then she was able to really soak it up and let this mother be in the despair and the terror and the shame and the, and the anger that she had in the orphanage, those experiences that were just so overwhelming to her. Okay. Uh, yeah, I want I have some tapes to show, but we're going to have a tea break in five minutes. So uh, I want to just say a few more things about this. Uh, this a stance that I really, uh, it's a very active stance, playful, accepting, curious, and empathic. Uh, and it, it facilitates a, a, a reciprocal dialogue. It's reciprocity. And I can do it with puppets, I could do it with drawings, but it has to be reciprocal. Uh, when I was trained as a non-directed play therapist, uh, there was no reciprocity with some of these pretty disturbed kids, some of the kids with a big trauma and attachment problems. They just perseverated, and they didn't use the play the way I thought they were supposed to, because they didn't know how to. They couldn't use metaphor. They didn't know how to use play for metaphor. They didn't know how to use play for connection with people. 
they don't know how to use play for anything other than this reenactment of the trauma. It just went on for, gone for, for years if I allowed it. Uh, okay, so if I'm looking for reciprocity, I'm looking for a back and forth communication, the contingent thing. I'm affecting the kid. I'm not wallpaper in, the, in my office. It was my first awareness of what was wrong with the session. I was wallpaper. The kid didn't want a human being. I was nothing but a piece of wallpaper to this kid. He, did, he just wanted to go on in a solitary way to do the same stuff over and over and over forever rather than have a relationship with somebody that can facilitate making sense of his life and moving on. So what I'm after is a flow of a dialogue. I'm after what I call affective reflective dialogue, which is a way to communicate with a kid that is very flowing, very sort of a relaxed movement that's storytelling. Uh, in terms of interventions, the most powerful intervention we've had for 20,000 years is storytelling. That's what people have done uh, before we had electricity and televisions. We sat around telling stories to people in our family, our community, our neighbors. And we loved the elders who could tell wonderful stories. Uh, we were very receptive to storytelling. And we tell stories with a sing-song quality to our voice in a very accepting way, just sort of a matter of fact, sort of a narrative. There's no lecture in a story. Lectures are the worst way to intervene with kids. Lectures to cause dissociation in about two seconds. <clears throat> they never work. Most of you probably do lectures with your children at home. I'm sorry to say they fail over and over. They just don't work. Uh, we just, that's a, we're slow learners about lectures, probably because we got so many ourselves. We dissociated all the time from lectures, and we were taught that lectures are supposed to help, and we're a poor parent if we don't give a lecture. When, in fact, uh, the best type of intervention that involves dialogue is storytelling, and is a profound difference. The storytelling has a cadence to the voice. It's more sing-song quality. The storyteller is more like how we talk to babies. There has an elements of surprise to it, has playfulness to it, uh, suspense. You pause, you really can hold kids' attention very long. Storytelling is the most effective way to work with ADHD kids. You could hold an ADHD kid for an hour if you're in deep in a story with them. Storytelling is a great way to help kids regulate their emotional states. You just pose them into it. And the stories that I tell are the stories of their lives. Those are the most powerful stories. Why won't they be interested in their own story? So I'm looking for storytelling. Now this isn't talking. There are a few things in life that make me defensive. When people say, you mean you just talk to kids? It's storytelling with kids. I'm creating a story with them. And it's more nonverbal than verbal. It's your tone of voice. It's your facial expressions. It's your gestures, your movement, touch changing variation in the cadence, how you do the beat of the story, the inflections, pausing. Those are the things that hold the kids' attention, regulate their emotional states, help them to make new meanings of the events of their lives. And everybody, everything in my office talks. Puppets talk, <laughs> stuffed animals talk, but they always talk in a different voice. They, all, they sound different, and depending on their emotional state, they <coughs> talk a little different too. Uh, it's, to me, the, the core intervention that I do is storytelling with the kids that I'm working with. And it's the same way we tell stories to our kids when our kids were babies, and the way we talk to babies before they know any words. <coughs> babies don't know a word we say, but they know what we're saying by our tone of voice our inflections, how we, we make it into a story. And also it causes a rhythm to the, it causes a movement. I'm responsible for working with traumatized kids. I'm responsible for the momentum of the session. I'm responsible to hold the story in my mind, hold the thread of it, and move toward a resolution of the trauma. That's my job, not theirs. They can't do it, they drift. They'll just drift around all sorts of things. If I lose that thread and I don't take the lead, in fact, this tape I show you after, after the break, 
you'll see me lose the thread of this hyperactive girl. <laughs> she goes, she starts talking about a mouse and all sorts of weird stuff. I had nothing to do with what we were talking about. It's because I lost the thread of the story and she can't tell a story. She can't tell her story. She doesn't have any momentum. She just drifts. Hyperactive kids drift terribly. They just talk about anything under the sun and they're here and now. So the slightest stimulus, the sun sound, all of a sudden they look at that. They see something, they start talking about that. They just go from one thing to the next to the next. Uh, they can't, they don't have a focus like that. Well, that's my responsibility to keep the, the momentum going. And if I can do that, if I can move moment, the momentum of the story and get the flow of the story going, kids will spontaneously talk about trauma. Things they've never brought up, all of a sudden they say, oh, we'll see tomorrow, I think I'll show you a tape of a kid who was, uh, uh, his grandmother died uh, six months before. He had never talked about it. In the middle of the session, toward the end of the session, I said, hey, I think it's about time to stop. He said, yeah. Oh, and my grandmother, you know what she did? You know, all of a sudden he knew how to tell a story. And he had a profound need to tell the story of the death of his grandmother. Well, that's the most integrated part of trauma resolution is moving it into our narrative, integrating it into our narrative. And that's what storytelling is about, to take it outside the narrative, which is in a dissociated part of the brain, and move it into the narrative. Uh, if I can facilitate that happening by getting the movement of the story going, kids often on their own will enter the parts that need to be brought into the narrative that have been split off, that they're dissociated from. Or if they don't, all I got to do is often when I get the flow, oh, oh I, we never talked about the time you were sexually abused by your dad. Would you tell me about it now? And they tell me. I don't adopt a serious tone first. Sometimes we scare kids. Would you, would you tell me about... Uh, being sexually abused by your dad and we say it with a tone of voice to say this is going to be a traumatic talking about it and they don't tell us why would they tell us when we're communicating this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life but if I say hey would you tell me about being sexually abused by your dad then they tell me because I'm communicating with confidence that you can tell that part of your story you don't have to be ashamed of that you don't have to be terrified of that memory if it gets scary we'll help you to regulate that it's my experience of this person. I've known you well enough. I know that you can handle telling me about the trauma. So I'm confident and I know it's in your best interest. So I just say, tell me about it. And the great majority of the time they tell me about it. Okay, why don't we take a uh, tea break? We'll be back in 15 minutes. Yeah.